Part 4, Anderson's Attack. Anderson's division attacked into the center of the Cemetery Ridge Line, which was a spot formerly held by the Union 3rd Corps and Caldwell's division of the 2nd Corps. Caldwell's division and most of the 3rd Corps had been drawn into the fighting around the wheat field, and now there was a huge gap here. But Anderson's attack faced a problem from the beginning. The two divisions that attacked before Anderson... McClaws and Hood were from Longstreet's Corps, and Anderson's division is from A.P. Hill's Corps. So doesn't it seem that the two Corps commanders should meet to share ideas and agree on how the attack should work? It seems for some reason that Longstreet and A.P. Hill never did meet before the attack to work out the details. Also, note that when McClaws and Hood's divisions attacked, it was in depth, with two brigades leading, followed by two in support like this. But Anderson's division attacked in a single line. Let's look at the position just before Anderson's attack started. Anderson's division is here highlighted in red. From the north, Mahone, Posey, Wright, Lang, and Wilcox's brigades. The two brigades on the north end, Mahone and Posey, never really joined the attack, so Anderson's division attacked with only three of his five brigades. Wright, Lang, and Wilcox. See the pie chart showing relative sizes. The brigades on the left and right flanks are the bigger ones, and that was Wilcox's brigade on the south and Wright's brigade on the north. Lang, the smaller brigade, was in the center. The units in front of Anderson's division on the left were two divisions from the Union 2nd Corps. That's Gibbons and Hayes' divisions. And on their right was Humphrey's division, from the 3rd Corps. Let's start the animation shortly after 6 p.m. Fighting was raging to the south between Longstreet's troops and Union troops around the wheat field. At about the same time as Barksdale's brigade launched their attack, Harrow's Union brigade was moved south and two of their regiments were moved forward to Emmitsburg Road. This was done to try to fill the gap between the Union's 2nd and 3rd Corps. Around 6.30 p.m., Anderson's division started their attack. Two regiments from Hall's Union Brigade were sent south, again trying to fill the gap between the 2nd and 3rd Corps. All of these regiments from Harrow's and Hall's brigades were overwhelmed by the Confederate attack. Willard's and Smythe's brigades from Hayes' division were also moved south, again trying to reinforce the line. General Hancock, the Corps commander, personally led Willard's brigade south. Humphrey's division was prepared to counterattack, but was overruled by General Burney, and he ordered them to make an organized retreat. I talked about this in Part 3. General Burney was appointed to take over 3rd Corps by General Sickles when he was wounded. See up to the northeast, Williams and Stewart's brigades from Ewell's Corps were moving into position preparing for the attack on Culp's Hill. A half hour after the attack started, Wright's, Lang's, and Wilcox's brigades were all across Emmitsburg Road and making good progress, but on their left, Posey's brigade had stopped. And why did they stop? More on that later. About this time, the Union 1st Minnesota pulled out of Harrow's brigade attacked Wilcox's Confederate Brigade. And it doesn't show on my map because the 1st Minnesota was a regiment, and the map doesn't show regiments, but it happened about here, marked by the black X. According to Bradley Godfrey in his book, Brigades of Gettysburg, the 1st Minnesota charged Wilcox's Brigade three times and slowed their advance, but the cost was that two-thirds of the regiment were killed or wounded in a ten-minute engagement. Following the 1st Minnesota attack, Willard's brigade attacked both Barksdale's and Wilcox's brigades and stopped their attack. Note that Ewell's attack on Culp's Hill to the north was now underway, and down here, brigades from the Union 6th Corps were streaming forward toward Little Round Top. Shortly afterward, according to Bradley Godfrey, Lang's brigade in the center had stopped to reform and catch their breath before a final assault. Then they got word that Wilcox's brigade, on their right, was retreating. 
the brigade commander, Colonel David Lang, began to fear being surrounded, and apparently at that point they were ordered to retreat. As Wright's brigade got closer and closer to the crest of the ridge, their commander, General Ambrose Wright, got more and more worried about his flanks. Lang's brigade on the right had stopped. Posey's brigade on their left was nowhere to be seen. And according to Bradley Gottfried, Wright appealed to his boss, General Anderson, the division commander, for help. Anderson's answer was that Posey's brigade had been ordered forward and Wright should continue to attack. Wright's brigade reached the crest of the ridge, penetrated the Union line alone, and then faced counterattacks on their front and both flanks. And Godfrey quoted a statement by General Wright. We were now in a critical condition. The enemy's converging line was rapidly closing upon our rear. A few moments more, and we would be completely surrounded. Still, no support could be seen coming to our assistance and with painful hearts we abandoned our captured guns, faced about, and prepared to cut our way through the closing lines to our rear. Wright, Lang's, and Wilcox's brigades fell back across Emmitsburg Road. Everyone seems to wonder what happened to Posey's brigade and Mahone's brigade. And these are well-known Gettysburg controversies, like, was Sickles' move forward a good thing or not? Posey went forward, but never even crossed Emmitsburg Road. Mahone's brigade didn't move until after the fighting was over, and they also did not cross Emmitsburg Road. Regarding Posey's brigade, maybe we should give credit to the Union troops they were facing. Regarding Mahone's brigade, I'm skeptical that the problem was with General Mahone. If Mahone was at fault, I'd expect to see evidence in his career after the battle. Maybe he'd retire or get transferred away. But on the contrary, Mahone remained with General Lee's army, was eventually promoted to major general, became a division commander, and was with Lee at Appomattox. It seems the verdict of his superiors was that General William Mahone was a good commander. If you're interested in more information on the Mahone Second Day Controversy, I recommend the YouTube video titled, Mahone's Brigade at Gettysburg, What Happened? It's 51 minutes long. I think it was very interesting, and it made lots of good points. And by the way, to the north, note Rhodes' division moving into position to attack East Cemetery Hill. Does it seem a bit late? More on that next in Part 5, Attacks on the Union Right Flank.